um, everyone. I'm Sebastian, and today I'm very excited to talk to you about efficient training of large language models. So, as I was preparing this talk yesterday, I say today, um, obviously the first thing to do is you. And so, go. Um, what should I talk about today? And Chinchilla mentions this trickle down method that apparently uh, its creators came up with, and it's very efficient. Asking Chinchilla, that sounds interesting. Can can you? It's a method to make it cheaper to train really large models. I don't know what the trickle down method is, so I won't be talking about that today. To talk about the question that we have to ask repeatedly when we large language models. And the question in particular is how do we train the best possible language model for a given compute budget? And so we answer this question in such a way that we can make predictions about what to do for large training runs. Interested in a large compute, we can't run sweeps. So you get one, one chance to the best possible model at that. Um, in, I won't go too much to the best part of this question and just assume we have a collection of downstream tasks that you to optimize. It could be negative log likelihood and a bunch of um, held out uh, data sets. It could be a question answer benchmark. It could be a bench, et cetera. So we did some of the scale laws um, for more optimal training of dense transformers. And the second one, which is augmented log retrieval. And so, yeah, let's get started with Chinchilla. So, as much of a huge collaboration, to all my amazing collaborators. Let's start with some introduction and scaling laws. So, so it'd be interesting to see yeah, how the compute um, budget for machine learning has evolved over the last, uh, this is like 70 years. Um, and so, there's this interesting paper by Isabella et al. from this year. Where they look at um, these, uh, I think it's 121 different models that have been trained from the largest uh, budgets at the time, and they identify two two errors basically. They identify a pre-error deep learning, where the compute uh, doubles every 18 months, uh, which is roughly in line with Moore's law. And since 2012, roughly, they identified this deep learning error, where compute seems to double much faster every six years, uh, which is faster than Moore's law which um, also implies that we're doing a distributed multi-system training more and more to be able to sustain that speed. And so for large language models, which uh, live in the very top right part of this plot, um, as I was mentioning earlier, you only get uh, one, one training run at a scale or very few training runs. So you need to know how your system is going to behave or you need to have good approximations. And so this is where the scaling goes. Um, come in. And the original paper by Kaplan et al. back in 2020 showed that for the, the autoregressive dense transformer language models, you can predict the, the performance quite accurately from a, a series of smaller models. And so, in particular, they have a bunch of scaling laws. But uh, the most interesting one is really the compute versus the test of uh, scaling law, which will tell you um, for a larger compute budget how well um, your model will be doing on, on the test loss. Now, there's a whole different question about what a certain test loss means in terms of capabilities. I think the community is only just starting to um, figure out what this means in, in terms of emergence and capabilities on, on downstream tasks, etc. So I, I won't go too much into that question today, but I think it's a very interesting question as well. And so from this came a whole uh, series of more papers, it's a whole subfield almost of different scaling goals. And so it's really um, examining how the behavior of the model changes as we scale various aspects. So there's the scaling loss for transfer by Hernandez et al, which looks at um, how much better fine tuning is than pre-training when you have a downstream data set you want to target and how that changes as you have more fine tuning data. Um, there's our work on mixture of expert models where we look at how adding branches or experts scales the model, and how that compares to dense models. And this then, um, yeah, allows you to make trade-offs in terms of what you want to train at scale is uh, answer questions such as, do I want to train a mixture of expert model or do I want to train a dense model? 
And uh, more recently, there's also uh, more scaling laws on, on data sets, and this is by Anthropic and so Hernandez said all here, uh, where they look at how having repeated data in the training uh, data set impacts um, the training performance or the, the final performance of language models and has also interesting implications uh, for large language model training. Um, but going back to the original paper, uh, one, of the, one of the key questions that allows us to answer is for a given fixed compute budget, which I do not see here, what is the optimal combination of uh, model size and number of training vectors? Because for transformers, there's a very simple uh, relationship between compute uh, number of parameters and uh, training tokens is just C equals to six, six ND. So everything is linear. So as you increase C, you have a choice of increasing the number of parameters or the number of training tokens. And in particular, what they find is that with a 10x compute budget, you should increase your parameter size by about five times and the amount of data you use for training by about two times. And so this has quite um, important implications for scaling because it means a uh, vast majority of capacity will go to parameter, which makes uh, engineering challenges of, state of scaling uh, quite real because um, as you increase parameters, you have many, much more memory, much more inter-device communication, et cetera, which makes this a hard problem. And it also means that um, large models or models trained with a lot of compute will be very expensive to do inference on because um, the inference cost of the model is, uh, is a linear function of the number of parameters. So if you use 10x more uh, training for compute, it says you'll spend about 5x more on inference cost as well for every token you want to predict or every token you want to get the log back here. Sure. Say something about what the numbers that we're given as to in the Yeah, so it's the negative log likelihood on that held out uh, at set. And so um, what we did after training uh, the Gopher models is we, we always look at how uh, the models perform with scale. And so we, we plot this uh, scaling plot where we, we're looking at how, um, if our models actually lie on this uh, optimal team, if they match uh, the scaling plot. And so what's quite apparent immediately is that the biggest model, the Gopher 280 billion parameter model, is actually quite far away from this optimal line, which is the black lines. And so the question then is why are we deviating from the scaling rule? And so there's roughly three natural hypotheses here. Um, the first one being that scaling laws are just purely empirical. So we don't have any guarantees. What we do is we take small models and take a fit and hope that they extrapolate. So we don't actually know whether they hold. Second one is, it's always at the back of my mind as well, is we just have a scaling bug that impacts the larger model more than smaller models or in a different way. And that could also uh, explain why it's uh, uh, underperforming what we would expect. And the third thing is uh, what we are looking at in that plot is actually not a valid scaling law. And the reason for this is quite subtle, but um, the reason is it's quite subtle. So we're using a cosine learning rate schedule with a predetermined horizon, which implies that to get the best performance for a model, you need to train for the full training horizon. And this means that uh, you can't get, you can't use intermediate training loss values, only the final uh, loss value is optimal. So in particular, if you look at this plot, um, you can see that the points we take to fit the line are uh, throughout training and not at the end of training. And this is actually not a valid thing to do because of the cosine learning rate schedule. Mm -hmm. And so this led us to re revisit the scaling laws and what's known as the chinchilla scaling laws now. Um, so and quick question. Yeah. Why should we take the points at the end? Um, because that's how um, it was done previously, actually. In, in, so in all previous work, it's usual to take the points in the middle of training, including in the original scaling course paper. And so we were following that. But in, that, in hindsight, that's not actually a correct thing to do. And the take the instrumentation, why did we not train as the convergence? Um, the reason is it's much cheaper to, to do the analysis because now, before for one training run, you could use any of the points along the training run, but this is not valid. And so if you can only take the trade, the final point for every point you want to an analyze, you need to do a full training run up, basically. And so it's much more expensive compute oil. Thank you. So at the end of the graph it is actually close to the, the line. Um, the black. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So for that one, we just uh, so far uh, we just take the last one because it's the closest. But okay. But it might be the case that if you had done it from the beginning up to every point, that it would have collapsed to the trend line. Uh. Yes. Okay. That's right. And yeah, so for Chinchilla, what we want to do is revisit this question of given a fixed flux budget, how should one trade off model size and the number of training tokens? And so we have to make a few assumptions here, three of the key ones. Um, the first one is we stick with this uh, power law uh, between the compute and the optical model size. And uh, this is the reason for this is it's a simple model that fits well with the empirical evidence we have. And also, it's a, a simple linear relationship in our block space, which makes it quite nice to work with. Uh, the second assumption is that all tokens are created equal. And so we have a big uh, uniform data set uh, where everything is of the same quality, roughly. But uh, intuitively, this is not true because some documents are likely much more informative than others uh, for trading. And so this is unlikely to be true, but it matches how things are currently done. And because the data sets are very large, I think the, the random baseline of assuming a uniform data set is actually not a bad assumption. And we also have to, or we also assume that we're training in the sub one epoch regime, so you don't do a full pass of the data you have. Um, but that's something that could also be revisited. And finally, the assumption we also make is that we're only looking at one model class, so autoregressive transformers. Um, we, we like, to, this is very unlikely to be the optimal model, but it's the best model we have at the moment at the scaling, so this is the model we're interested in. And so to answer this question, we, we have three different empirical approaches we take in this paper, and they're roughly, um, the first one I call isoparams, where we're trying to model the optimal number of uh, uh, model characters as a function of training tokens directly. And you can do this by fixing the model size and varying the number of training tokens for various firms and then trying to extrapolate that fit. The second one is isoflops. It's similar, but instead of fixing the model size, you fix the flops and you vary the model size and training tokens accordingly. And you can then model uh, directly and explicitly the optimal number of training parameters and tokens as a function of the compute budget you want to allocate for training. And the third approach, um, is more um, explicit because we directly model the final loss as a function of the uh, training tokens and training parameters. Um, the second approach is uh, the cleanest one. And so I'll go into this one to more details here, but all the details are in the paper. Um, so let's say you have a flops budget now and you want to find what the optimal combination is of training parameters and uh, training arise. So the nice thing you would do in this case is uh, train a few models and vary the model size. And what you get is something that looks like this, um, where you have each point is the final training loss of a training run. And you see that this is roughly a nice uh, parabola. And so the natural thing to do here is to get uh, some line and take the minimum. And so now you know that if you have one in 20 flops, the optimal model to train would be a roughly 1.2 billion parameter model. Um, but the thing is, we're not actually interested in the 1 in 20 uh, flops regime, but a much larger flops regime, uh, and a flops regime at which we can't actually run this screen on. So what we need to do is extrapolate this point to a much larger flop regime. And to do this, you train a whole bunch of uh, further uh, flop budgets, and you can fit a, a parabola to each, of, each one of those and find the minimum. And doing this, you can then extrapolate the optimal parameter count for each of the slot budgets. And you get these points in a 2D space with parameters on one axis and flops on the other axis, uh, which looks like this. And using this, you can then uh, do an extrapolation. So you fit a power law between the flops budget and the optimal model size. Then you can ask if I have the same amount of flops. Uh, as we use for training gopher, which is 576 and 23, uh, what's the optimal model size that should be trained? And this tells you it should be a 60 billion parameter model. And yeah, you can do the same for training tokens, and the answer in that case is about 1.4 trillion tokens. And so we did just that. We trained the model with the more optimal um, settings, and this is the model we call Chinchilla. And so the interesting thing about Chinchilla is that it's trained on the exact same data set as Gopher, 
and it's trained on the exact same amount of uh, flops. So it's really to test that scale of whether our scaling laws and our extrapolation works. And so we can look at the, the three approaches from the paper and how they, how they predict what we should be doing at Chichilla scale, which is the, the green star. And uh, we were quite pleased to see that all three approaches do seem to agree quite well. Um, if you look at the black dotted line, that's the previous scaling laws uh, from the original Kaplan and all paper. And you can see that um, both uh, GT3 and Megatron, three really other large language models, actually lie quite close to that line, but seem uh, quite far off from what we predict to be off. And yeah, this is just a quick summary of current large language models, but the takeaway is uh, Chinchilla is much smaller, about two x smaller than the other models, but it's trained for much longer. And we, we expect this to make a big difference. Could I ask something? Is the, you said Tinjilla's trained on the same data set as Hofer. Does that mean it did more epochs? Uh, so it's the same scrape and same data set. Okay. But in both cases, we're actually in the sub one epoch regime still. So it's seeing more data from the same data distribution, but not the exact same data. And so to evaluate these models, we can look at the performance on downstream benchmarks. And so here there's uh, question answering benchmarks, common sense, and natural language, na natural language understanding benchmarks. And, and the takeaway is that uh, Chinchilla does outperform Gopher uh, quite, signif quite significantly on, on all of them, and even outperform some, some models that were trained with a larger compute budget, such as the, the Megatron Turing uh, model. Um, so, yeah, let's go into. Uh, Retro, our work on augmenting these large language models with retrieval. And again, it's a huge collaboration, um, which would be possible in all the amazing collaborators. Um, but as we have we seen now, um, NLP relies more and more on these very large transformer models for solving many tasks. And in particular, these are mostly autoregressive transformer decoders trained on the next token prediction task. And these are trained on very large data sets. And so one of the, the questions we try to answer here is, can we make this more efficient in training models with large capacity for only a fraction of the compute cost by actually changing the model? And so we're getting rid of this uh, third assumption I had earlier that was fixed, and now we're trying to find better model classes that scale uh, more efficiently. And so the way we intend to do this is by adding an explicit memory to language models. And so we know that scaling models has roughly two effects very naively. The first one is that it increases the memorization of training data. The second one is it increases the generalization performance. So in this work, we're kind of trying to tease out the two or separate out the two and add the ability to explicitly memorize the training data uh, via an external uh, non-parametric data store and instead make better use of the parameters the model has for the generalization or reasoning part. And so this is definitely not a new idea. It's an old idea in natural language processing, um, the idea of external memory and uh, associating that with tra training your networks. Um, however, if, if you look at the existing work of uh, previous to Retro, um, you can see that a lot of it is focused on small uh, data sets and databases. So often it's focused on Wikipedia, which contains about 3 billion tokens. And the model sizes are often quite small, uh, about 250 million characters. And so in this work, what we're really trying to do is bring that line of work into the large language model space. And more particularly, what we have is a data set which contains about 2 trillion tokens, uh, the massive text data set we have. And uh, for the models as well, what we want is that they're able to access all of this uh, training data uh, all of this uh, training data set during uh, training. Um, and this requires changes uh, to, to how retrieval is done. And we also want to plug all of this retrieval data into the parametric models, which requires adapting the architecture uh, in some ways. But the bottom line is, is in this work in Retro, what we were able to do is increase the database size by roughly three orders of magnitude and the model size by about 50x compared to previous work on retrieval. And to make this happen, uh, there's a few key design principles we had to adhere on. So firstly, previous work for retrieval often retrieves at the token level. 
So for even token, you're trying to predict and retrieve some information. Um, when you do this at the two trillion uh, database size, it's not possible to run a search at that size. So instead, what we have to do is to uh, chunk the data set. So we split up the, the training documents into roughly 64 tokens, uh, chunks of 64 tokens, and this gives us about uh, 30 billion chunks. And it turns out that doing approximate retrieval at 30, at the 30 billion scale is quite doable. And in fact, it's, it's surprisingly fast for the, for the modern library. It takes about I think, 10 or 15 milliseconds to do a lookup. The second uh, design principle we had to deal on is that we use a, a, a frozen retriever model. And this is because end-to-end -end training, uh, for example, how Realm does it, means you have to update your whole database of 30 billion abelians repeatedly. And doing this is, is just too expensive compute-wise. And what this also allows us to do is actually pre-compute the whole data set. So it means you do the, the nearest neighbor search once uh, offline before starting to train all of your models. And this allows you to have a retrieval augmented data set and iterate on your model uh, much faster than if you had to do it for every model training run. And thirdly, what we want is something that's comparable to GPT-3 and is autoregressive model. So we want a pure language modeling objective loss, so predicting the next token, and we want the model to be fully autoregressive. Okay. And so um, I won't go too much into the architecture, but as I was just saying, um, the model is fully autoregressive. And what this allows you to do is sampling with retrieval queries in the loop. So if you imagine getting a prompt as the bottom left chunk in green, the first thing we do is we retrieve some relevant neighbors and uh, sample the next chunk conditioning on that. And you can repeat this process uh, as many times as you'd like to retrieve and then condition. And this gives you a fully autoaggressive model. So next, I want to go into some quantitative results we got with Retro. And so as uh, most things we do, we evaluate things by looking at scaling. And so here I'm showing uh, the test loss for a few uh, model sizes, ranging 170 million parameters to seven and a half billion. And what we're mostly interest interested in is the difference between the baseline, so the triangles, and the retrieval uh, retro on method, the circles. And what's key really when scaling is that the, the improvements do not diminish with scale, because if they would diminish, it would mean that um, at very large scales, your method would not outperform the baseline. And so this seems to be the case here for, for retrieval. The second interesting thing to note is that um, the gains are very heavily data set dependent. And so, for example, for Wiki, Wikitext 103, which contains uh, Wikipedia articles, gains from doing retrieval are very high. And uh, one explanation for this is that um, Wikipedia contains a lot of information, a lot of text that's repeated very heavily on the web. And so actually being able to look that up explicitly is very helpful. Whereas creation corpus, which is on the left, uh, we evaluate the likelihood of uh, human written summaries that can't be found on the web. And so actually looking up uh, similar documents or retrieving information is not necessarily useful because the summarization task is kind of self-contained in the task as well, and you don't need external knowledge. And the third data set on the right is a uh, data set we created, and it's, we call it Wikipedia September 2021, because it only contains Wikipedia articles uh, from after when our training data set or our retrieval data set was constructed. So we, we only took about 20 or 30 articles of, of entities that did not um, exist on Wikipedia in the training data set. And what's interesting here is, um, despite we, despite the fact that we know there's no um, that these didn't exist in the retrieval database, we're still seeing quite significant improvements. And one of the reasons for this is that actually, if you look at Wikipedia articles, it turns out they all follow very similar patterns. And people, when they write new Wikipedia articles, end up copying and pasting a lot of information that they found elsewhere on the web. And so we, we're retrieving similar patterns, which help with the uh, language modeling loss in that case. Next, what we can look at is uh, see how retro improves when we, uh, when we scale the, the retrieval database. And so starting with a, the baseline where we don't retrieve from anything across in the far left and scaling up to the full data, uh, data set of two trillion tokens, 
what we can clearly see is that there's huge uh, and continuous improvements as we scale this uh, database size. And again, what we're looking for always is the scaling behavior. And so what we can see is that the improvement uh, is for all models and the improvement is not diminishing as we scale, which is always what we're looking for. Similarly, what we can do at um, evaluation time as well is increase the number of neighbors we retrieve for each chunk. So during training, we, we always trade with two neighbors retrieved per chunk, but during evaluation, we can scale this. And here the simulation shows that what happens when we scale up to about 100 neighbors. And so what we can see is that for small models, the 172 million variety model, uh, you see improvements up to about 20 or 15 or 20 neighbors. But for the large model, uh, you can get improvements up to 40 neighbors. And so what this seems to imply is that the larger models are actually able to better utilize additional neighbors. And it probably also means that we should have trained with more than two neighbors. Um, and finally, we also look at PIA, which is a, uh, a standard benchmark of language uh, modeling tasks or data sets. What's bits per byte? Yeah, so bits per byte is the same as negative block likelihood, but adjusted for the tokenized. Uh, so it's for, for the tokenizers, for how you tokenize words. Because when you do negative log likelihood, normally you divide by the number of tokens, which is an artifact of your, of your model. And so it's, it's a different measure of uh, your ability to compress it, which is more, which you can compare across the models, which often you can't do for negative log likelihood. And yeah, so. I think the key takeaway here is that uh, for some data sets, retro uh, strongly outperforms uh, the baselines, despite being much smaller. And so uh, the extreme is GitHub, where we're actually adding retrieval is helping massively because um, I think as we all know, a lot of coding is copy and paste, copy and pasting code that we find uh, in other places and reusing that. And so being able to explicitly look up that code is, is quite useful uh, when you're trying to predict it or generate code. Do you have access to the GitHub? Because they have some AI product now, uh, pilot. Something. Yeah, so, so this is a, a benchmark of data sets that was released by, I uh, forgot which group, but it's called the PAL. And so there's a whole bunch of different scraped data sets, but it includes uh, GitHub, is one of them. I guess maybe you'll get to that in the conclusion. Um, I've thought about this bunch, uh, and I'm not quite sure. Like, So, like, these models are. So they go for and, and Jurassic one, obviously much bigger in terms of the parameter, like pure parametric parameters of the model. Um, did you calculate, like, I guess the blocks you did on the throughput um, and how many neighbors would be required for the compute requirement for the retro forward pass to be similar to a go for example? I, I don't have a good sense of like how many is needed, maybe like 10 or maybe like 100,000. Yeah, we haven't actually done that, but um, so when we do retro, we only add cross tension layers quite infrequently, every 10 layers, for example. Sure. So the additional flux cost of doing that retrieval purely in the forward paths of the model uh, would be quite small. Mm -hmm. Now, if you try to incorporate all the flux spent on embedding the data set and doing the retrieval lookup, et cetera, that would change the equation somewhat, but I haven't thought too much about that. That's fairly amortized. So that is fully amortized. Yeah. Um, or, yeah, not when you sample actually, because you don't know what the tokens are going to be. So you have to do online retrieval. But these modern, um, they're super fast uh, lookups, tens of milliseconds for. Sorry, there's, there's a um, deep mind product called Alpha Code. Yes. Does that rely on the data set of Jet? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think on some version of it. I'm not sure it's the pilot version. The good GitHub's code uh, pilot product, and it's owned by Microsoft. So they they're yeah. competing with Google's alpha code by using the same data set. Uh, I don't know if it's the exact same data set. Okay. Exactly. That's just the whole of the trends. The whole of that model is not like a model. Yeah. I mean, 
Yeah, so yeah, there's no there's no product to market for it. Do you know the change in performance of retro of the different data sets has to do with the availability of sort of relevant text in the lookup? Like, is it is it better at GitHub because there's lots of code in the massive text and the worst archive and there's fewer archives in there or something? Or there's nothing to do with that. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting question. And so retro really kind of does two things. Um, there's a, the copy pasting or looking up exact words, uh, which actually helps a ton when you're doing language modeling, but helps less when you're actually looking at a downstream task or like uh, factual knowledge retrieval, et cetera. But we also do observe that aspect of uh, improvements in question mapping and uh, more knowledge intensive tasks where it actually helps uh, with retrieval allows you to look up uh, relevant information. And so when you see these huge improvements, like for example, on GitHub, I think it's really comes down to the fact that like, being able to, to find a very similar code and knowing very precisely what kind of uh, template to follow. I have a question about generalization. If I understood correctly, each of these data sets you create a retrieval agent based on that data set. Do you look at what happens if you so actually we, we always retrieve from the training data um, and so this is the, the huge two trillion uh, token database and we evaluate the specific that's task uh, and we do some filtering uh, of the training data set so we try uh, we try to filter out so we filter out exact document matches and we also do an approximate filtering where if the document in the training test and the training data set is too similar to the document in the test set we do remove it but it's quite, it's actually very, very hard to do uh, a perfect recall at scale. Again. So there's, it ends up being still quite a bit of leakage. Um, yeah, so to conclude, I thought it might be uh, interesting if, uh, or I, I wanted to go some, or through some of the not so bitter lessons of scaling language models. Uh, that's a play on Richard Sutton says. Might be. Uh, that, um, <laughs> that I've been gathering uh, since I started working on it. And so the first one is doing single things well is actually very hard, but goes very far. And so one, one detail of that, or one implication of that, is that details matter a lot. And you really want to go into every detail that is surprising to you and you don't expect and make sure you fix it and understand actually what's going on. because it might not impact things too much at small scale, but when you go to large scale, uh, small small differences or small bugs might be amplified, and your large models that might be significantly underperforming what you predicted it to be doing. And another implication of this is actually that uh, the cost of doing complex approaches is often quite high, and especially when you, when you end up scaling, which means you end up having with having to deal with many details at once, and you don't have a chance to actually fix all of these details. And so doing complex approaches uh, often doesn't scale as well. Um, the second approach is something I mentioned earlier a bit already, but is that scaling is actually a great filter of ideas and you should use it to your advantage. Uh, many of the ideas we try do seem quite promising and, sh and show improvements at small scale, but they don't end up scaling as well as just uh, working as well as a scaling dumb approach. And one implication of this as well is that when we train these very large models, where you only get to do one or two training runs and don't get to sweep over anything, is that you don't want to take much risk actually when you train it because you don't get to do it again the next day if, if you mess it up. And so we end up uh, having to train on your things where we have high certainty that they will actually work at scale. And yeah, I think this is one of the reasons for why all these large language models are still transformers and very similar to original transformers. And the final point is that methodology is very important. And so small inconsistencies or oversights might completely invalidate your results at scale. And the best example of this is the difference between the chinchilla scaling laws and the original Kaplan non scaling laws, where a small, I think a small oversight in how the learning rate schedule impacted things um, meant that you ended up with huge differences in that scale. And so one implication of this is that you should really um, iterate over the method methodology you have at small, at small scale first and make sure that that's uh, very solid for going to that um, Yeah, that's, that's it for me.